So I'd like to now invite uh, Kathy Garf, who is um, the surprise speaker uh, about uh, Justly Anderson. She just said to me, do you have a part on this program? <laughs> <laughs> well, Jessely Anderson was born to greatness. As an Ellison and a Barlow from Leighton, Utah, there were high expectations for Jessely. She was born into a family who generously exemplified community-minded lives of service. Let me share with you a few lesser known facts about Jessely. She worked to Lagoon in her youth, as did every true county girl. She loved floating down the Colorado River, even before the Glen Canyon Dam existed. One summer was so sunburned her shirt stuck to her blistered back. It's rumored that she was a rodeo queen in Leighton. Her love for horses and ranching led her to the National Cowboy Poetry Gathering in Elko where she currently sits on its Board of Governors. But her parents saw a great need to send Jessely to Switzerland to finishing school for a year. She graduated in political science at the University of Utah and has served on so many educational boards, but she recently received an honorary doctorate. So here's to you, Dr. Jessely. Scott and Jessely's courtship is most unique. After Jessely graduated from the U, she promptly left her beloved Davis County home to work in Washington, D.C. She worked with Utah's congressional delegation with such greats as Sherm Lloyd and Wallace Bennett. She later joined forces with HUD and the Republican National Committee, where she was a trusted, quote, bag lady, unquote. In those days, she traveled around the country collecting money from donors in her unmarked bag loaded with cash. Meanwhile, Scott Anderson was receiving his master's degree in economics and international studies at Johns Hopkins. His cousin asked Jess Lee to look out for him. So Jessely would lend him her car for his dates. Eventually, they started seeing each other, and he accepted a job in Japan with the Bank of America. She flew to Japan to visit him on one occasion, and after she returned, she re received, through the mail, a proposal. <laughs> they were later married in Japan, spent seven years ago, seven years there. Jessely is the modern day male bride. <laughs> but let me list a few of the gifts Jessely has been to the University of Utah. While on campus, she was active in the Chi Mega sorority and will long be remembered for her many shenanigans while she lived in the house and when she influenced the many pledges. She's presently the chair of the National Advisory Council better known as the NAC. She was the chair of the new museum, the Museum of Natural History, and was instrumental in its formation, its fundraising, and its building. The beautiful display of Native American baskets were acquired through her expert persuasion. I hope you've all been there to see it. She was the chair of the Children's Center on the university campus, by the way, her mother was instrumental in starting the Children's Center here at the U. It's since been moved off campus. She's been on the board of the University Hospital. She served and is serving on several educational community boards. She's presently a member of the prestigious Utah State Board of Regents. Jessely has a gift of willingness to serve others. Combined with her gifts of intelligence and resourcefulness on endless boards, she's the most sought after woman in the community to serve on any board. Her institutional knowledge of community organizations results in respect and gratitude by community leaders. Jessely has a great gift of humility and graciousness. I've got to give credit to her parents for sending her to finishing school. 
She's equally comfortable with kings and queens, presidents and CEOs, as she is with the poor and the needy. One of her favorite volunteer efforts is driving her SUV loaded with foodstuffs for the elderly Native American population. As she drives into reservations at Big Mountain, Arizona, or Navajo Mountain in southern Utah, the elderly women know her by name, and she lovingly mingles and communicates freely with them. Jess Lee has a rare gift of compassion for others. In her neighborhood, she and a select few of women have quietly formed a special needs group, where every week they determine the important nurturing needs of those suffering in her area. Jessely has a genuine gift of friendship. Whenever she enters a room, all immediately feel of her genuine and gracious concern for each one of us. Have you noticed she has that constant, radiant smile on her face that tells us all is well with the world? Jess Lee has a beautiful gift of motherhood. She and Scott have three wonderful children and five perfect grandchildren. She has a gift of genuine integrity and is absolutely authentic. She stays incredibly close to her God and her family. She does the right things for the right reasons. And Jess Lee's first love is to be with her husband. They are equally yoked traveling around the state supporting local communities and ending up at the University of Utah as ardent and devoted youth supporters. They both bleed red and consider this honor today as one of the finest that Jess Lee has ever received. In conclusion, I'm reminded of Helen Keller's thoughts about friendship. There are red letter days in our lives when we meet people who thrill us like a fine poem. People whose handshake is brimful of unspoken sympathy and whose rich natures impart to our eager, impatient spirits a wonderful restfulness. While such friends are near us, we feel that all is well. Thank you for selecting my friend Jessely. Um, I, I feel like um, I don't have a lot to add uh, to what Kathy said, but let me tell you why we uh, selected Jessely. So as uh, Kathy described, she received her degree from the Department of Political Science, and the amount of um, experience you have in the educational field is just amazing. Going to lunch with Jessely is like getting uh, that just wise advice um, that you really can't get from many other people. In addition to the boards that Kathy mentioned, she um, really serves on um, many boards, including trustee at Salt Lake Community College, Westminster College, also at the Lean Walker Institute of Politics and Public Service at Weber State. And as, as I was preparing these remarks, it reminded me we need to go to lunch again because I have some new things I need your advice on. Um, her advice has been really just invaluable, and, and I would, as, as Kathy mentioned, just encourage you to have a conversation with her. You'll come away learning a great deal. So we are very grateful for all your service at the university. We're delighted that you're one of our own. Uh, and uh, I'm delighted to be able to award you the Distinguished Alumna of the College of Social and Behavioral Science. So thank you very much. I'd like to set the record straight. There's probably only about 12% of that that has any truth to it. <laughs> Despite the Garf's great motto, we listen. In this case, they didn't. <laughs> but, uh, it, it is an honor to be here and to accept this. I, I really don't feel qualified because I'm not sure I could meet the requirements of a student today to, to graduate out of this distinguished college, but it was such a remarkable time in my life. It changed my life. 
the associations I had here at the University of Utah in the poli-sci department. I think in those days, there wasn't a college of social and behavioral science. I'm not even sure what college we fell under, but it was a wonderful time, a, a simpler time, and it made a great impact, not only on the friendships I made, but the wonderful teachers that instilled with me a desire to be involved and, and uh, just a great time of great memories and I'm grateful. And if I had any wish, it would be that every student that goes through this college could leave with the same enriched, uplifting experience that I had. And I'm really thankful for this recognition and for the great work you do with all of the students here. Thank you. Great. Um, I'd now like to invite um, Donna Gelfand, who's the former dean of the College of Social and Behavioral Science, who is going to come talk to us about um, Eugene Andreessen. Thank you, Cindy. It's a real pleasure uh, to offer a few comments to honor Eugene K. Andreessen, who wants to be called Gene, not Eugene, for his lifelong achievement in many pursuits and his kindness and generosity to others, especially to students. He has a strong commitment to education and to helping students. He's made many gifts to the University of Utah, and especially scholarships for our CSBS, that's our college, uh, students and environmental causes. And he certainly was not born with a silver spoon in his mouth. Uh, he had to work very, very hard to uh, get to his destination today. He comes from a Salt Lake City family. How many of you are related to Gene? As you can see, we have, we have packed the house. <laughs> His parents uh, developed in their children a belief in hard work and outreach to people who unfortunately found themselves in bad circumstances. The Great Depression had struck uh, at the time Gene was uh, in his childhood, and he decided that he would get a job. And he approached uh, a truck farmer, Zhu Jin, uh, a Chinese immigrant, for a job. He said, he, I'll do anything. And so he got a job of pushing a two-handled cultivator down rows of celery, um, which seems like a hard job for a 10-year-old, but he said it wasn't. Uh, <laughs> do you know how much he got an hour? What was his wage? Does anyone have a guess? This We're coming out of the Depression. It's not going to be high. What do you think it was? Anyone? Come on. Five cents. What? Five cents. Five cents is exactly right. Somebody knew that. <laughs> five cents an hour. You could buy an apple for five cents on the street at that time. Uh, he worked 10 hours a day. Uh, and as he got older, he branched out, got a newspaper route, uh, ran a service station for uh, its owner who had gotten ill, uh, was a clerk in a pharmacy and a grocery store. He did a lot of work, as, as did other youngsters at that time. It was a hard time. It's hard for people to make a go of it. Uh, he entered the University of Utah, and uh, he majored in industrial psychology, which we don't offer today. That's in the business school, but we did then. Um, he sang in the men's choir. Uh, he got an offer from Professor Richard D. Condy to sing in the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. So he was fairly accomplished at that, but he couldn't. Uh, because he was in, also enrolled in ROTC, he got commissioned, 
he got sent to Korea, to the Korean War, where he served with distinction. Came back, joined a Prudential uh, insurance company, stayed with them for 27 years. Like many people who grew up in Utah, he's a hiker. Um, and he's been a lifelong hiker. Uh, one day he noticed that the Sierra Club was looking for um, somebody who would be willing to take groups down to the bottom of the Grand Canyon and back. Have you, anyone here has done that? I mean, I looked over the edge and I saw these bedraggled figures, you know, barely able to make it back and I thought, I would never like to do that. But he did it not only once, but many times. And he's, uh, he says he's given up hiking, but he does walk two miles a day. Um, at the age of 91, pretty good. Um, Gene is living out his parents' wishes that their children use their resources to help others. Uh, he's helped many of his nephews and nieces through scholarships. He's given them to go to college. They pick out a college, they get a fixed amount, and that gets them started. Now, those unfortunate few who've decided they are not going to college, Jean calls their parents, says, we've got to get them into college, and applies the pressure. I, 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 some of you may have felt that, and I hope you've profited from it. Um, we've known each other for almost 20 years, I would say. Um, when he came uh, one day to my office and, and expressed his willingness to help us uh, as an advisory board uh, member and a donor, and he stayed with this college loyally ever since, and we have profited from it. His, um, his family, he thinks, may have taken 20 or so scholarships from him, and he and I tried to estimate how many scholarships uh, have come to students in the in the college, and we think that may be 70, Steve, do you think that's 70, 80? It's a lot of scholarships. It's a lot of students who have benefited from his generosity. <clears throat> um, Jean is also a member of the Park Society and has established a planned gift to the University of Utah, for which we're very grateful. Some graduates don't think that their psychology degree is related to their occupation in fields like medicine, business, and law. I scowl at them when they tell me that, <laughs> but that's how they feel. Jean has a different perspective on it, and, here, and his is, and I'm quoting, studying psychology leads you to introspect more you don't just take everything on the surface. That's helped me understand myself and people more. And I thought, oh, not many people have that insight. It's a wonderful thing. That's exactly what faculty members wish for. Students who become thoughtful and truly educated beyond completing assignments and tests. That's not what it's about. So, that's a brief glimpse of a remarkable man who's made and continues to make contribution to his family, his business, his alma mater, his community, and our nation. He should feel satisfaction in the support that he's given to the many students who have profited from it. Uh, a scholarship is not just the money, of course. That's quickly gone. What stays with the student is the conviction that they've been singled out, that someone thinks, or some group thinks, uh, very well of them and expects great things of them. They can use that scholarship as they're applying for further education or for jobs, and it always benefits them. Um, so, <clears throat> We are, excuse me, I don't know why I'm croaking, but we are so grateful for his example 
his support, and his friendship. Great. Well, um, uh, let me just tell you a few other reasons. Uh, thank you, Donna. That was great um, for why we selected Gene. Um, uh, Gene's contributions have been really si significant, and it, I'm just delighted to meet him uh, today. When I first notified Gene of uh, his selection, he questioned his selection. He said, well, I'm just an ordinary guy. And I think you can see from Donna's comments that that's not quite true, Gene. We don't agree with you. Um, they really have been truly significant contributions. Um, he has contributed to the University of Utah since the time he graduated, which is really amazing. Uh, and then with his company, Prudential, uh, began matching those gifts. <coughs> then he worked with uh, Donna Gelfand uh, to make more substantial gifts. And by our accounts, it's somewhere around 50 students who have received those scholarships. Um, through the sort of hard work that uh, Donna mentioned, he uh, did very well, and he's created a $1 million charitable uh, trust to the College of Social and Behavioral Science, which we are truly grateful for. Um, as I mentioned to Jean on the phone when I first called, we're really very uh, honored um, to recognize all of his con contributions and his really lifelong commitment to education, which is, which is truly remarkable. Uh, I've, I've actually heard from your family that you've probably got as many gifts to nieces, nephews, grandnieces, and, and nephews as you have to the university. So I just think it's, it's really remarkable. Uh, you're going to have such an enduring influence on students for years and years to come. So it is just my honor to uh, present you with the Distinguished Alumna Award of the College of Social and Behavioral Science. Again, I, I think much of what was said was an exaggeration of, of really the true things. But uh, just a couple of things I thought I'd mention. One, the, the act of giving gifts, especially to deserving people like students who are deserving in every case. Uh, I, uh, it's hard to describe the feeling that I get every time I give a gift. It's wonderful. Try it. I guess that covers just about everything. But <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's certainly a pleasure to be called upon for this to come here and meet with all of you and with these other people who have done such fine things. I appreciate it. Thank you. And Rob, I think we need to sign both Justin Lee and, and Jean up to our development uh, team. This is great. Um, uh, as uh, I'm now, I uh, would like to invite Linda Newman up as a surprise speaker for uh, uh, Dr. Colleen Caputo. Thank you. I come at this podium different than those who have spoken previously from an educator standpoint. I come as a friend. And I probably am not going to do Colleen the justice that she deserves because I know her through friendship and not through her accolades at the university. But Colleen and I met in an exercise class 39 years ago. And that class got canceled and so we said, oh, we need to do something and so what, what should we try? So the two of us, not having been friends before, met and decided we would walk or jog 
on the, you know, on the uh, Davis Boulevard in Bountiful. So that became three mornings a week at 5.30 a.m. We met at a specified place, and we did our three-mile walk each morning, and that went on for 24 years. And we felt this was more than just physical interaction and physical therapy. It truly was a psychiatric therapy, and with no charge, we really benefited from that interaction. We discussed and we solved so many world problems, and I know they could use our help today. So. <laughs> we had many personal discussions about raising our families and our feelings and uh, what our emotions were at different times. And these we knew would go no further than the boulevard. And during this time, I came to admire and appreciate many things about my friend. Some of these that you might find of interest is that she does love the outdoors, and she loves that quiet joy of nature. She is, enjoys the unique creations of southern Utah landscape where she now lives. She's hiked the Narrows with friends, and I do know that some made it out and some didn't, and that Colleen made it out because of her determination, and that says a lot about her personality. She's run the rapids of Flaming Gorge and Green River. She's done a lot of traveling around the world, both with friends and family, and especially enjoyed it with her grandchildren. She's always been physically active, stressing the importance of being in good shape. And currently, she still swims three days a week. She's always loved the water and exercise. She participates in yoga weekly, enjoys walking, hiking, and at one time, biking. She stays so young through these physical efforts. And good health is very important to her. She loves to go to the farmer's market, which was another activity we enjoyed together, until things changed a lot at the farmer's market. But she does that, and she focuses on maintaining good health. Other interests, interests for her have been gardening. I know that she knows how to play the violin. <clears throat> and prior to her education focus, she was an airline stewardess. Colleen established a wonderful tradition with each of her grandchildren. She has five, and when each of them turned eight years old, then she would accompany that child on a Rhodes Scholar intergenerational trip that would take a week or so, and she would take just that child and do such things as horseback riding, river rafting, hiking, educational settings, and so forth, bringing a very close love and appreciation and bond for each of those children. She also has two young great-grandchildren and loves them dearly and speaks of them often. Her true passion has been education, and she comes by this naturally in following her grandfather's footsteps. He was an educator. Beyond being the department chair, Colleen, and a member of this department, she has extended her efforts to assist others in their quest for furthering their education. She has revised and published her grandfather's biography, Benjamin Clough, Jr., who served as principal of Brigham Young Academy and president of Brigham Young University from 1890 to 1903. And as was mentioned by previous recipients, she has given much in her efforts to further the education of others. She has established a Benjamin Clough Jr. Family Foundation, and this is an annual lecture series where faculty awards are given in her grandfather's name at Brigham Young University. As Colleen moved or to pursue her, her doctorate, she had the support of a wonderful woman. Colleen moved back to Iowa State to receive this doctorate degree. 
and her mother moved with her to care for Steph and Steve as they needed someone to be with them while she pursued her degree. Following her retirement from the university, she moved to St. George. And that did not mean she retired because she has stayed very active and involved in the community. She's been working with the Make-A-Wish Foundation, St. George Area Chamber of Commerce, the Huntsman Senior Games, and humanitarian projects for the Dove Center, the Food Bank, and Children's Justice Center. Colleen leaves nothing to chance. She has a sense of order in everything she does, and she thoroughly researches any decision-making process. I love the ease with which she interacts with people. It's been a good example to me. I've loved her integrity, her intellect, and her devotion to family, friends, and those that are in need. Being a friend to Colleen has enriched my life immensely. She has the ability to elevate and to inspire people to do and be their best. Colleen is a wonderful, caring, and giving individual who is so worthy of receiving this beautiful award today. Congratulations, Colleen. Thank you so much, Linda. That was really lovely. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about uh, Dr. Colleen Caputo. Uh, as is noted in your program, uh, she's had a very long and distinguished um, connection to her department and college, beginning as an undergraduate major in home economics education here at the U. She then went on to work uh, and on her master's and PhD at Iowa State. Uh, and she did so with two young children, and now we understand that there was family support there because I was wondering how in the world you did that. Four and a seven-year-old. Um, seven um, she then joined the faculty back here at the Family and Consumer Studies Department in 1976 and was really instrumental in making it the interdisciplinary program that it is today, uh, becoming chair in 1984. And I understand that it was through her leadership that she eliminated her own sub-area, seeing that the future was going in a different direction. And just a word of warning for those of you who are out there in the audience, I'm going to use that um, as an example, because I thought that was uh, very tough choices that eventuated actually in the, into the graduate program and a stronger, more research-oriented faculty. In 2004, she created the Colleen Clough Caputo Scholarship in the Department of Family and Consumer Studies, which has supported around 10 students now over the last decade. Um, Colleen, we're so very grateful for your leadership, for your generosity, um, your vision of what your department could become. Uh, and so many of them are here today, which we're thrilled, and helping so many students really pursue an educational dream. Uh, I'm just really delighted to present you as the distinguished alumna of the College of Social and Behavioral Science. So thank you very much. getting short, but I did want to say it's always nice to return home to the campus of the University of Utah, and especially nice when you have a reserved parking place <laughs> and you don't have to find a place. When Dean Bird called me, I shared the information with a good friend who I walk with now in St. George, since Linda won't well, move to St. George for some reason. <laughs> and shared the, the information and she stopped and turned and looked at me and she said, do they still remember you? <laughs> <laughs> and it is nice to be remembered. Thank you very, very much. And thank you for the colleagues that are here. Uh, that association is so wonderful. And my family and friends, uh, important people in my life. Thank you very much. Great, and I'd now like to invite Amy Iring uh, up, who is the uh, surprise speaker for Matt Iring. Were you surprised, Matt? 
Okay. <laughs> well, it's great to be here, and I just want to thank the university for this honor for Matt. It's um, wonderful to be here and be part of it, and I'm so happy to be able to share just a few words about Matt. Um, he speaks fondly of his years here at the university, and um, appreciates very much all that he learned and the wonderful associations he had with great professors and fellow classmates and he jokes however that he hopes he truly did graduate he had just taken a new job his first job in boston in a management consulting firm and um, was so eager to start the job that he missed his graduation ceremony and actually receiving his diploma so, um, but we did check. He did, in fact, uh, graduate and received his BA in economics. Um, but I think he does regret missing his, his college graduation. Uh, Matt is a very hard worker. Whatever he decides to do, he puts his whole heart into it and his best effort. Um, and he loves creating and growing businesses. He's a true entrepreneur at heart. And he really seeks um, for the benefit and well-being of whether it's his clients or um, us as a family, the community he's in, he really gives his all. And when Matt um, and I first met, he was working at a strategic management company in Boston. And um, we met on a blind date here in Utah when he was home visiting family. And he had told me he was working out at Boston. But after a few dates, I started receiving these long-distance phone calls, international phone calls. And I said, Matt, where, where are you? And he said, well, I didn't want to tell you this, but I actually live in La Paz, Bolivia. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't strong marketing um, points. Uh, just having met you to let you know for strategy that this is where I live. But he was doing some country competitiveness work for this consulting firm in Bolivia. And, but it was true love. We got married and I moved to Bolivia with him and um, he did really incredible work there in Bolivia helping the government there raise exports to the states and that was a really neat adventure to share that with him and he did promise me when we were married that my life would not be boring and he has made good on that promise. After our time in Bolivia we spent time in Boston and um, where he um, went to school, and then after that, he took a job at Medtronic, a medical device company in Minneapolis. And that was also a really neat experience for him, where he helped create the company strategy that is still in effect um, there today. And um, following that, we moved back to Boston, where he, for nearly a decade, worked at InnoSight, another management consulting company, where he was the managing partner there, and did some really neat work. Um, with the company and one of his passions is healthcare and I'll just share this one example of his influence there. Medtronic who he, who he had worked for previously uh, was now a client of his and um, they went to India and he helped with the strategy there to provide healthcare, particularly pacemaker devices to those without, um, without the means to afford it there and literally I think has saved over 15,000 lives with that. The last I just read up on it as of 2015, 15,000 people lives have been saved because of those pacemakers being made available. And so that's kind of really, really neat and special work that he did there. Um, so we were outside of Utah for nearly 20 years and about almost four years ago we moved back to Utah um, for Matt to take a job at Vivint where he is currently overseeing all the technology and um, where he's the chief strategy and innovation officer. So we're delighted to be back in Utah. And I think of all these great accomplishments that Matt has done in his professional career, what means the most to me is his leadership and influence in my life and in our home and with our children. We have five children, three daughters and two sons who are here with us today. And I asked them what they loved most about their dad and I think for Matt, this will be the biggest compliments that he can receive. Our children said, he's always there for me. He finds time for us and has fun with us. He is very nice, wise, and kind. My dad always pushes us to be the best we can be. He has a genuine desire for us to succeed and is always there to help and encourage us and along every step of the way. He's fun to hang out with. He's funny and he's smart. 
I love my dad because he teaches me how to work hard and is the best example to me, and I want to be just like him when I grow up. So Matt, we love you and um, are so grateful for your influence in our lives and for all the lives that you've blessed. And thank you for the university for this honor to him. Great, that was, that was terrific, Amy. So let me tell you a little bit more about Matt. Um, as Amy said, um, he majored in economics here at the University of Utah and then went on to receive his MBA. He didn't tell the, the little school that he went to, the Harvard Business School. Um, and uh, I won't repeat what Amy said about all of it he's doing at, at Vivint and all of these other companies. Um, but last spring, Matt came and talked with our students and um, was so gracious with your time. Uh, the, the students and faculty, he gave a talk on career planning and internships, the world of the smart home. He provided just incredible insights about how students are going to have to pivot many, many times in their career. And um, I have heard so many people talk about that. Actually, many of us as administrators have talked about, like, how can we prepare those students for those pivots? Um, these and other topics are the subject of several uh, Harvard Business Review articles that Matt has co-authored. Uh, and so we are just delighted to reconnect with you and to count you as an alum of the uh, College of Social and Behavioral Science. So. I just wanted to thank the Co College of Social and Behavioral Science. I, I Just looking through past recipients and listening today, I don't think I... I don't know if I belong with this um, group at all, but I think I represent the uh, 52,631 um, alums that are mentioned here who received what I would consider an amazing liberal arts degree in a world where people talk about um, STEM and other things like that. I was, uh, I was giving a talk in Silicon Valley uh, two days ago where I was on stage and I just thought, um, as important as, data, as important as data science is and artificial intelligence and the many things that are going on in the world, the foundation of a lot of the impact that is happening in the world um, happens because of the great liberal arts education that's happening here and nowhere is it done better in the world than, than right here at the University of Utah. Thanks so much. We might put that on a commercial now. That was great. <laughs> um, so I'd like to invite uh, Steve Ott, also former dean of the College of Social Behavioral Science, who I've asked to speak a little bit about Paul Slack. Thank you, Sydney. As the program notes, Paul Slack is not a graduate of the College of Social Behavioral Science. He's an honorary uh, alumna, alumnus excuse me, of, of the college. Um, by the way, I'm not married to Paul and I'm not his best friend, um, so I can't go into quite as much detail as, as the two preceding. On the other hand, um, I'm one of his true admirers and I'd like to be, I hope I'm considered one of his friends. Uh, first on the official side, uh, I really urge you to take a look carefully uh, at the very brief bio that's, that's in uh, the program. Um, this is a person who has contributed so much um, to the United States of America, risking his life, uh, to the state of Utah, uh, to the College of Social Behavioral Science, and to many of us associated with it at the U, as well as being a, a leader of industry um, in Utah. And the way he blended them was extremely artful. Uh, but officially, uh, Paul D. Slack, U.S. Marine Corps, retired Brigadier General, recipient of the Silver Star, or as I understand officially, the Silver Star Medal, which is, as I understand it, one of only three medals uh, awarded uh, by the President of the United States. It is particularly for conspicuous gallantry in action while in combat, in, his, in Paul's case, uh, in Vietnam. Um, He's not a graduate of the University of Utah, he's a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy. After retiring from the military, he went to Iomega Corporation uh, here in Utah, 
where he worked as, he started pretty high, uh, became senior vice president, special assistant to the president, uh, and at one time was spokesperson for the company uh, on the stage. Um, incidentally, I need to mention, the program does, in about that long, say that at one point Paul was military assistant to the vice president of the United States. He does not advertise the fact that that vice president happened to be Spiro Agnew. <laughs> <laughs> I am quite sure he is far more uh, proud of his Silver Star and his Legion of Honor. Um, although I'm sure it was interesting time while working with the Vice President. In the state of Utah, uh, I'm just going to pick a few. Uh, trustee of the Utah Information Technologies Association, Board of the Ogden Chamber, Board of the Weber State University College of Business, Board of the National Ability Center, Utah Manufacturers Association, that I have to stay with my notes, they get longer. Utah Governor's Partnership for Education and Economic Development, Utah Governor's Information Technology Development Task Force. Okay. I inherited Paul, that's how I met him. Uh, Dean Downer Gelfand had um, gotten together with Paul on the advisory board. Now. I'm going by his words, so if this turns out to be false or overstatement, then, then you have to blame him for it. But as Paul explained to me, he approached um, Dean Gelfand about getting uh, involved with the university and the College of Social and Behavioral Science because he felt that with his military and industrial background that he really should be putting his talents to work teaching University of Utah faculty members how to teach more effectively. As Paul put it, it didn't take him very long to learn that the University of Utah faculty were not particularly receptive <laughs> to military retirees and business people telling them how to teach. Um, as it's mentioned, I believe, in your program, um, Paul has also, while uh, affiliated with the CSPS Advisory Board, established a scholarship, and in his spirit of generosity, in the name of Rich Brewer, one of his best friends, who, who is here today, and, and for which we are very proud. But while I was dean, um, there were some difficult times, and I learned quickly to turn to Paul for help when the going really got tough. And I don't think many of you know, um, it was around, help me with this, Paul, maybe 2003, 2004, 2002, that then President Bernie Matchett summoned me to his office and informed me that I, as dean of the college, was going to close the Clint Hinckley Institute of Politics down that he had just returned from another session meeting with legislators, and I tried to remember his exact words, but when he ordered me to close the Hinckley Institute and replace it with a public policy institute, his words and reasoning were, we will not subject any more of our, I will not use the adjective, students, to those idiots in the Utah State Legislature again, and with no institutes, with no internships with the state legislature, there's no purpose for the ink cleaning institute closing. Never in my life have I pulled up, he was standing, by the way, he, for those of you who didn't know, he was about 6'4", um, and was standing on a brick fireplace ledge in his office. And I don't know what made me do it, but I came up out of my chair and I, walked toward him and he started walking backwards, so I kept walking forward. <laughs> um, I got him to slow down and say, let us, let us plan and come up with something workable here. That's when I engaged with Paul. And Paul with a number of other um, neat um, people, but really Paul is the linchpin put the idea together and formed a proposal for a School of Public and International Affairs that would have included the Hinckley Institute of Politics and many other things. We put it to um, 
then senior academic vice president Dave Pershing, who turned it to the Institute of Public and International Affairs. But with all that, then we had to go into implementation. I just turned it all over to Paul and nothing happened as you, but actually that's not quite the case. We got a long ways along. And I really could not have ever, ever done it without Paul. Um, in working with Paul, I, I learned several things, uh, important lessons. One, when you don't want advice, don't ask for it. <laughs> when Paul, if you, with Paul also, if you don't want to be challenged on your facts, don't open the door for him to do it. Uh, Paul is a wealth of knowledge experience that spans the globe. Um, as again is mentioned in the uh, program, uh, he has been teaching Paul's for 15 years, 10 years, how many? 16, 16 years. I uh, started with a course on the military industrial complex and I think he was averaging about four students per course. <laughs> Um, so a couple of us sat down, talked it through, worked it out, and he continues to teach a course in the Master of Public Administration program with a lot of Master of Public Policy students and undergraduates in international security policy. My understanding now is it is a little more difficult to get into that uh, course. So other than the other award recipients that are here today, um, I can't think of anyone more deserving uh, especially of, a, of an honorary um, award. He's contributed to the nation, to the state, to the university, to the college. He's been a leader in industry and has maintained a sense of integrity um, without compare. Um, I am pleased, honored to introduce Paul Slack to you. Uh, I also hope again that he would agree that we are friends. Paul, it is um, really a pleasure for me to uh, introduce our honorary distinguished alumnus of the college. Um, my comments overlap nearly, <coughs> over, no, nearly exactly with uh, former Dean Ott, I guess two deans think alike. Um, and I just want to thank you for your generosity to the college. For it's, it's been about 20 years uh, that he's had a scholarship in the College of Social and Behavioral Science. I understand that the funds that he gets from teaching just sort of go directly into um, this particular scholarship. So if any of you out there want your uh, paycheck to be diverted, we can, we can absolutely accommodate you. So um, I'm really delighted to um, present you the honorary alumnus of the college. So thank you so much. Uh, I'm humbled uh, to be in the presence of these distinguished graduates. And uh, unfortunately, I wasn't smart enough to be born here in Ogden, Utah, like Bruce Brewer was. But uh, I managed to spend enough time out here to really find the roots. But to uh, put one thing uh, in perspective, you know, when I moved west, I discovered that if, uh, if you're going to tell a story, you know, if it's not a good story, you embellish it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, uh, you know, carried me a long way in the classrooms. Uh, I had some mentors, and uh, Irv Altman, and of course Steve, and Dean Donna. I worked for four deans, and um, had a chance to be on the board, the first board. And uh, actually, um, most of us thought we were going to be advisors. That's what Steve, Steve <laughs> mentions. And the first time uh, my friend Ralph and I wound up in the geography uh, department uh, to do some help, you know, because uh, distance learning was important. We didn't have a lot of brick and mortar at the time and everything. Well, it lasted about 15 minutes. When, Who are you guys? Why are you here? Well, that, uh, it wasn't right. It wasn't the right time, really. 
But I, I'm so thankful. I, I actually have taken away more from the University of Utah than I've been able to add. I'm glad they finally tore down Osh because Rich Brewer went to class with there in the early 50s and there I am lecturing in the same building with too hot in the summer and too cold in the winter. But we're going to have good days, we really are. But um, most of my contemporaries um, sit around in their pajamas in the morning and flood the email world uh, with things that you finally have to put stop don't take those kinds of things. Uh, in my case, uh, I found that uh, by working with the college, uh, I found a really productive thing to do with the rest of my retired life. Uh, I do have to apologize for the high school picture, though. Uh, <laughs> I was having a little uh, repair work done at the uh, University of Utah Hospital when I got the call for a head and shoulder shot, and I didn't think that the, the gown in the high school would put in the university would be a very, very good thing. Again, thank you very, very much for the opportunity to, to be associated with him. Paul is only four weeks out from open heart surgery, so I don't know how all of these alums do it. It's really remarkable. Well, I want to thank our recipients, their families and friends, uh, and those of you from the college who've come to honor these recipients. I also want to thank the college staff, most especially um, Rob Hunsinger, if you could stand, Glenn Gordon, Emily Bennett, Jacoby, and Rick Nelson, as well as our college ambassadors for uh, your help uh, Also the School of Music, um, uh, Red Hot's performer Austin Gren was our guitarist, I think he may have left. Um, but again, thank you for all of, of your work. So as I think about the impact of this year's um, awardees, I am really honored in my role as dean to be able to get to know you. It's one of um, the true pleasures, I'd have to say, of this position. Uh, because your stories help us remember that the students that we sit around each day uh, are going to become the, the, the people that you are. Um, and it's just really an honor uh, to hear um, I think from years past, how much the faculty mean for your experience, and to me, it really inspires us to do our very, very best uh, for students. Um, I've really been inspired by all of you, and, and I would have to agree with Jean's uh, uh, message today that, as Rockefeller once mentioned, I think of giving not only as a duty, but really as a privilege, and I think for each of you, uh, that experience of giving of your time, of your uh, scholarship, of your, of your funds to, to really uh, further the lives of students has been really great. So we're grateful for the incredible accomplishments of you all. We're just very proud that you're our alums. Uh, and thank you so much for making a real difference in the lives of students.